Model Test 7, Listening Section. The listening section tests your ability to understand spoken English that is typical of interactions and academic speech on college campuses. During the test, you will listen to conversations, lectures, and discussions, and you will answer questions about them. This is the long format for the listening section. On the long format, you will listen to three conversations, three lectures, and three discussions. After each listening passage, you will answer five to six questions about it. Only two conversations, two lectures, and two discussions will be graded. The other passages are part of an experimental section for future tests. Because you will not know which conversations, lectures, and discussions will be graded, you must try to do your best on all of them. You will hear each passage one time. You may take notes while you listen, but notes are not graded. You may use your notes to answer the questions. Choose the best answer for multiple choice questions. Follow the directions on the page or on the screen for computer-assisted questions. Click on Next and then on OK to go on to the next question. You cannot return to previous questions. The listening section is divided into sets. Each set includes one conversation, one lecture, and one discussion. You have 10 minutes to answer all of the questions for each set. You will have 30 minutes to answer all of the questions on the long format. A clock on the screen will show you how much time you have to complete your answers for the section. The clock does not count the time you are listening to the conversations, lectures, and discussions. Listening 1, Professor's Office Listen to a conversation between a student and a professor. Okay, Chris. Do you understand why I asked you to see me? I guess so. I did something in class. I apologize. But do you understand what's bothering me? No, not really. I like your class. I'm glad you do. But, Chris, you're disturbing the other students with your constant talking. I am? Yes. I've had several people complain about it. They're missing key parts of the lecture because you're talking. But I'm talking about the lecture. I'm not just making conversation. Look, Chris, it doesn't matter. When I am talking, you should be listening. Well, I'm sorry. Sometimes I don't get a word or a phrase, so I ask someone about it. Okay, I really don't think you're creating a disturbance on purpose. If I did, I'd simply ask you to drop the class, period. Oh, please don't do that. That's not my plan, but it has to be an option. Look, maybe you need to record the lectures. I don't mind if you do that. Then you can fill in the blanks when you listen the second time instead of asking your neighbor during the class. That's a great idea. I really wanted to do that, but I was thinking you probably wouldn't want me to. And another thing. If you have questions, I need you to write them down and make an appointment to talk with me about them. That's why I have office hours twice a week. Just call the department and we'll arrange a time. Excuse me, Dr. Pierce. Can I tell you something? Um, I'm embarrassed to ask you questions. <laughs> Why in the world would that be? I ask for questions at the end of every lecture. I encourage students to use my office hours. I know you do. It's just that where I went to school before I came here, if you asked a professor a question, it was an insult because, because it implied that he hadn't explained everything well. You see, if the professor does a good job on the lecture, everything will be clear and no one will need to ask a question. I see. Well, it's different here. I'm not saying that your other experience is wrong. I'm just saying that we do things differently at the university in this country. In my class, I don't expect you to understand everything in the lectures. And I don't take it as a challenge when someone asks a question. I view the question as kind of a compliment, because it means that person is very interested and is really trying to learn. That's the kind of student I want. So I can ask you questions in class? Or in my office. Just don't ask other students questions while I'm trying to give my lecture. That does upset me. Oh, Professor Pierce, I'm so sorry. I was trying to be respectful. I'm interested in the class, and I want to know everything. I see that. Now I'm asking you to show your interest and respect in a different way. I want you to ask me the questions at the times that I provide for question and answer. At the end of the lecture and during my office hours. And I can record the lectures? Yes. Just don't make a lot of noise in class, okay? Oh, no, I won't. <laughs> Thank you so much. 1. Why does the man go to see his professor? 
Two. Listen again to part of the conversation and then answer the following question. I like your class. I'm glad you do. But Chris, you're disturbing the other students with your constant talking. I am. Why does the student say this? I am. Three. Listen again to part of the conversation and then answer the following question. I really don't think you're creating a disturbance on purpose. If I did, I'd simply ask you to drop the class, period. Oh, please don't do that. That's not my plan, but it has to be an option. What does the professor mean when she says this? That's not my plan, but it has to be an option. Four. How does the professor feel about questions in class? Five. What will the man probably do during the next class? Listening to art class. Listen to part of a lecture in an art class. Symmetry is a concept that, yes, is expressed in the graphic arts, but to understand its fundamental nature, we must go beyond art. We find symmetry in nature. It reverberates in music, translates into choreography for dance, and underlies basic mathematical formulas. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's begin with a dictionary definition of symmetry, and I'm reading here from the American Heritage Dictionary of the English Language. Symmetry is exact correspondence of form and constituent configuration on opposite sides of a dividing line or plane, or about a center or an axis. And it's also identified、uh, in the same source as beauty as a result of balance or harmonious arrangement. So we experience beauty and harmony when symmetry of form is expressed, and the form may be interpreted by any of the senses as harmonious. But in this class, we're going to focus on symmetry in the visual arts, and that's symmetry in a visual plane. Let's just look at some examples. In general, there are four types of symmetry in a plane, and a pattern is symmetrical if there's at least one type of symmetry. So. Let me show you the four types, since it's much easier to understand when you see them. This is rotation symmetry. For this example, I used the letter R, but any object could have been used. And in the rotation, the object, in this example, the letter R, is turned around a center. In this case, there's a right angle, but any angle could have been selected. Reflection is. Wait a minute. Okay, here's the slide. Reflection is what we see in a mirror, so every reflection has a mirror line. A reflection of the letter R is a mirror image or a backwards letter R. So, unlike the rotation around a circle, this type of symmetry flips the object over. Here's a translation. To translate an object means that we move it. But we do it without rotation or reflection; it's simply placed somewhere else on the plane. And for our purposes, we're talking about a flat plane. So, in this example, we just moved it over a little bit. Okay, this is my last example of symmetry, and it's referred to as glide reflection. This is the most complex type of symmetry because it involves two steps instead of one. A glide reflection is a combination of a reflection and a translation along the direction of the mirror line. So you can see the two steps here. First, we flip it over, and then we move it somewhere else on the plane. Of course, these concepts can be generalized to include spatial symmetry as well. But symmetry on a flat plane involves positioning all points around the plane so their positions in relationship to each remain constant, 
although their absolute positions may be subject to change. To put it in simple terms, if an object looks the same to you after you spin it around, flip it over, or look at it in a mirror, then that object probably has symmetry. Symmetry is such a fundamental organizing principle that an object with symmetry can be identified without our being able to see the, the entire object. Our brains somehow piece together the missing pieces to form a symmetrical whole, which is really rather extraordinary when you think about it. At some very basic level, symmetry may be part of the way that we, that we organize our thinking, and of course, that would explain why it's so pleasing. So now, let's return to symmetry in art. Symmetry stands out and attracts attention. It's the system of organization for patterns. But what is a pattern? A pattern has three characteristics. A system for organization, and like we said before, this is often symmetry, but a pattern also has a basic unit. That is, uh, it's an object that's the smallest discrete part of the image. As you'll recall from the types of symmetry that we discussed, the letter R was the basic unit. Okay, finally, a pattern has repetition, which can be the repetition of a unit or a group of units. And this repetition, in much of art, this repetition is arranged symmetrically. Just look around the classroom. Look at the tiles on the floor. Here you see a symmetrical design with four repeating tiles. The tiles were not placed at random. There's a pattern here with all three characteristics of a pattern. First, there's a unit, a basic unit, of four tiles. Second, there's repetition of the tiles with solid tiles surrounding them. And third, there's symmetry within the four tiles, which, to be specific, looks like rotation symmetry to me. Now, for your studio assignment, I want you to draw a pattern that has as its organizing principle a symmetrical design. It can be either in color or in black and white, but it must fit on a piece of standard 8.5 by 11 inch paper. On a second sheet of paper, I want you to identify the type of symmetry that you used. Perhaps some of you will want to experiment with several types of symmetry, but if you do, please be sure to identify each of them clearly in your narrative. For this first effort, I recommend that you stick to something relatively simple, like the tile floor. So when you come to class next week, be ready to share your design with three other people in a group. Then I'll collect them at the end of the hour. 6. What is this lecture mainly about? Seven. Listen again to part of the lecture and then answer the following question. We find symmetry in nature. It reverberates in music, translates into choreography for dance, and underlies basic mathematical formulas. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's begin with a dictionary definition of symmetry. What does the professor mean when he says this? But I'm getting ahead of myself. Eight. Which of the following slides represents reflection symmetry? Click on the correct diagram. Nine. How is it possible to recognize an object when only part of it is visible? Ten. In addition to a system for organization, what characteristics define a pattern? Eleven. What assignment does the professor give his students? Listening 3. Sociology class. Listen to part of a discussion in a sociology class. 
The professor is talking about gangs. Last class, I asked you to read some articles about gang activity. We're trying to come up with a definition, so let's just go around the table and share what we found. Tracy, will you begin, please? Okay. Um, actually, I read a review of the research for sociological studies on gang activity, and I found that gangs have been prevalent for much longer than I'd assumed. I was so surprised. For some reason, I thought that gang activity was a fairly recent phenomenon, but actually, one of the largest studies was carried out by Thrasher in 1936. Good, good. I'm pleased that you found that. Thrasher's studies a classic research investigation. Can you summarize the findings of the Thrasher study? Sure. First, I should say that the study included more than 1,300 gangs with more than 25,000 members. So. According to Thrasher, a gang is a group that may form spontaneously, but after that, it'll integrate, and that happens through conflict and violence. Over time, a spirit of solidarity and an attachment to a local territory kind of forms. What's most interesting, besides the long history of gangs in the United States, the interesting part, it's the fact that not much has changed over the years. And、uh, oh, oh yes, gang behavior seems pretty similar even across cultures. That is interesting, Doctor Jackson. May I go next? I have just a brief comment that seems to fit in here. Please. Well, another classic study, much later, about 1987 or eight, I think, by Joan Moore. That study indicated that gang behavior is probably caused by normal adolescent insecurities, the desire for peer approval, respect. Support, acceptance, and in some cases protection. If the neighborhood's perceived as dangerous, it seems that gangs take the place of the more childish cliques, those in groups that develop in high schools. Good point. And if we can refer back to the Thrasher study, he also suggested that gangs actually form in playgroups where children of a very young age begin with the usual games like hide and seek or kickball. And progress as they get older to playing craps or engaging in petty theft on the street. Now back to Moore, Bill. Right. Well, what about Moore's definition of a gang? That relates to the Thrasher study. Oh, I see what you mean. I have that right here. Moore defined a gang as an unsupervised peer group who is socialized by the streets rather than by conventional institutions. And I was thinking that the institutions might be schools, churches, organized clubs like boys' clubs, and one other thing. Moore emphasized that the gang had to define itself as a gang, you know, with some kind of criteria for membership that'd be recognized by all the gang members, such as such as participating in a crime, either stealing something and bringing it back to the gang, or or even killing someone in an initiation. Dr. Jackson, I looked up the definitions of gang members by police departments and law enforcement agencies. Oh, great! Let's hear it. Okay. Well, according to the California Youth Gang Task Force, for example, a gang member will be recognizable because of gang-related tattoos, clothing, and paraphernalia like scarves and hats that identify a particular gang. And sometimes these are called the colors. So that allows other people to confirm that the people with the colors on, that they have a right to be on the gang's turf, and to follow up on Tracy's comments about the history of gangs, it looks like these criteria have been in place for a long, long time. Good job. So far, what I'm hearing, though, what I'm hearing refers to gang membership in general. So now let's talk about the ages of gang members. Typically, who belongs to a gang? Well, this was an eye opener. There seem to be stages, or maybe not stages, but at least categories of gang membership. It starts about age ten or twelve, which fits in with what you were saying earlier about playgroups. So these kids are playing together, and they start writing graffiti on their school lockers or their notebooks, and they look up to the gang members who are about fourteen to twenty. So the little kids are peewees, and the teenagers are called gangbangers. But the members who are twenty to twenty-five years old. They're the hardcores, and most of the gangs that I read about didn't have very many members over 25 years old. So I would say that in general, 
gang memberships for young men. Thanks for your assessment of membership by age. And I'd certainly agree with you. But what about females? Did anyone find any research on their role in gang activity? I did. And there are a few girl gangs. That's what they called them in the references. But I found that females are generally not considered members of the male-dominated gang. They're viewed as more of a support system and an extended social group, uh, friends and girlfriends to party with. That's what I found, too. And another interesting thing, maybe this is naive, but I sort of imagined that gang activity was always, always criminal activity. But uh, according to a study by, it was James Lasley, he looked at gangs in Los Angeles about 10 years ago. And anyway, he found that they spent a lot of time hanging out, listening to music, drinking beer, and just partying with their girlfriends. And he made another good point. Since they don't have spending money to go places like the movies or ball games, the neighborhood is their entertainment. Yeah, I read that study. Didn't he say that some of the criminal activity was for fun, not really for financial gain? Exactly. And there seems to be very little planning, just kind of going with whatever turns up. Of course, there are instances of crimes for revenge or honor to maintain the reputation of the gang, but a lot of the time... Crimes simply occur while gang members are looking for something to do. 12. How does the professor organize the discussion? Thirteen. What was surprising about Thrasher's study? Fourteen. According to the study by Moore, what causes gang activity? Fifteen. Listen again to part of the discussion, and then answer the following question. And one other thing. Moore emphasized that the gang had to define itself as a gang, you know, with some kind of criteria for membership that'd be recognized by all the gang members. Such as? Why does the professor say this? Such as? Sixteen. What is the role of women in gangs? Seventeen. In the discussion, the students identify aspects of gang activity. Indicate whether each of the following is one of the aspects. Click in the correct box for each phrase. Listening four. Students on campus. Listen to part of a conversation between two students. Hi. How'd your presentation go? Really well. See, I told you. I know, but I was really nervous. So what happened? Well, the TA asked for volunteers to go first, and I raised my hand right away because I wanted to get it over with before I got any more nervous than I already was. So you went first? Yeah, and I used a lot of visuals. I had about 20 slides on PowerPoint, and that really helped me to stay on track. I mean, I didn't read the slides to the class or anything, but, you know, some of the titles kind of jogged my memory. So I knew what I wanted to say while each slide was shown. That's the beauty of PowerPoint. Of course, I'm always afraid the computer program won't work. And then there I am without anything. But I made overheads, you know, copies of all the slides just in case. So you could have used the overhead projector as a backup. Good idea. And I had most of the stuff on handouts, so they could follow along without spending a lot of time taking notes. That way I could move along faster and get more in, in ten minutes. Yeah, ten minutes isn't very long when you're trying to present something as complex as population density. <laughs> That's for sure. The maps really helped. A picture's worth a thousand words. So true. Listen, I can't remember whether you had a group or you had to present all by yourself. You had a choice. 
but I decided to do my own presentation. I don't know. Group projects are really popular, but, you know. I hear you. I'd rather take responsibility for the whole presentation if I were you. No surprises that way. Is that one of your handouts? Wow, that looks fantastic. It's easy. PowerPoint has an option for putting the slides on a handout. Still, it looks so professional. Thanks. So, did you have any questions after the presentation? Not really. I think people were mostly just wanting to get on with their own presentations. But they seemed interested. Oh, yeah. And the TA said something about getting off to such a good start. So I felt good about that. 18. What are the students discussing? Nineteen. Which strategy does the woman use for her presentation? Twenty. Why did the woman make overhead copies of the slides? Twenty-one. Listen again to part of the conversation, and then answer the following question. You had a choice, but I decided to do my own presentation. I don't know. Group projects are really popular, but, you know. I hear you. What does the man mean when he says this? I hear you. Twenty-two. Why didn't the class ask questions after the presentation? Listening five. Biology class. Listen to part of a lecture in a biology class. By studying the fossil record, we can read the history of life on Earth. Interestingly enough, it appears that there are long periods in which not very much change occurs, then sporadic brief periods in which there are mass extinctions of species, followed by diversification of the groups that survived. How does this happen? Well, sometimes a habitat's destroyed or the environment changes. Did you know that if the temperature of the ocean falls by even a few degrees, many species will die? Incredible, isn't it? Or, even when the environment's relatively stable, biological conditions can change when other species evolve in different directions. For example, let's see, when a similar species evolves by developing a shell, then the related species without shells may be more vulnerable to predators and could become extinct as a result of changes in the other species. So you can see that extinction's a natural consequence of history. It's, well, inevitable. But sometimes mass extinctions occur and most of the known species are lost. And this is very different. Let me mention two such mass extinctions. First, the Permian mass extinction, which occurred about 250 million years ago. According to fossil records, more than 90% of the marine species and about 30% of the orders of insects perished. Then about 65 million years ago, the Cretaceous mass extinction claimed more than half of the marine species and many terrestrial species of plants and animals, including the dinosaurs. So what causes mass extinction? This isn't an easy question to answer. You see, it's obvious from the fossil records that species exist during a certain geological time period, and then they disappear. And we have solid evidence for that. But why they disappear is, well, more speculative. In the Permian, several extreme conditions may have converged, including the merging of the continents into one large landmass. As you can imagine, such a radical change in the distribution of land and water would have disturbed habitats and caused the climate to change. There's also evidence that volcanic activity during this period may have produced enough carbon dioxide to cause global warming, which in turn would have affected the temperature and depth of the oceans. And it and I'm referring here to global warming, so it probably also caused the oxygen levels in the oceans to decrease. All of these conditions could have converged to extinguish an enormous number of species at the same time. 
That's mass extinction. And a similar set of conditions may also have contributed to the mass extinction in the Cretaceous period as well. We can gather data that convinces us about continental drift, that it occurred along with receding seas along the continental coastlines. In addition, we know that cooler climate was probably the result, at least in part, of increased volcanic eruptions, and these eruptions probably released enough material into the atmosphere to block the sunlight. Having said all of that, many scientists now favor a very different hypothesis. They theorize that maybe a large asteroid collided with the Earth. Advocates of the so-called impact hypothesis speculate that there were two events that caused the mass extinction. First, the impact probably caused a firestorm of such proportion that most of the life in North America would have been decimated within minutes. Second, they postulate that an enormous cloud of fallout could have blocked out the sunlight, and that the impact was, in fact, large enough to darken the Earth. And we're talking about months or even years. So the result of the darkness, I mean, that would have caused a reduction in photosynthesis, which in turn would have created a disruption in the food chain. Now, such a disruption would have affected many species. So the advocates of the impact hypothesis, they put forward evidence that a thin layer of clay, rich in iridium deposits, uh, can be found in the geologic material that separates the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic eras, precisely the time period for the Cretaceous mass extinction. So what's special about this clay? Well, iridium's a very rare element on Earth, but it's quite common in meteorites and other extraterrestrial debris that's been analyzed. So it's possible that this sediment is the remains of the impact. The fact that there was more serious damage to the species in the Western Hemisphere could also be explained by the point of impact and the fact that the dust cloud could have caused more acidic precipitation nearer the area of impact. Or there may have been a number of calamities that converged simultaneously, disrupting planetary balances. But whatever the cause or causes, the fact remains that the mass extinctions occurred, and they influenced the biological diversity of our planet in profound ways. The species that survived, whether because they had genetic advantages or because they were fortunate enough to be farther from the catastrophes, these species became the ancestors of the species that have played important roles in biological evolutionary history. 23. What aspect of the fossil record is this lecture mainly about? Twenty four. Identify the main periods of mass extinction. Twenty five. Listen again to part of the lecture and then answer the following question. You see, it's obvious from the fossil records that species exist during a certain geological time period and then they disappear. And we have solid evidence for that. But why they disappear is, well, more speculative. Why does the professor say this? But why they disappear is, well, more speculative. 26. What is the impact hypothesis? Twenty seven. What is the evidence for the impact hypothesis? Twenty eight. What can be inferred about the professor's opinion? Listening 6. Anthropology class. Listen to part of a discussion in an anthropology class. The professor is talking about totem poles. Some of the largest and most elaborate totem poles are those carved by the Haida people, 
who live on Queen Charlotte Island, about 150 kilometers west of the coast of British Columbia, as well as on the smaller islands along the west coast of Canada. These islands are densely covered with huge red cedar trees that have served for many years as the material for the poles. Some of the totem poles are as tall as the trees themselves. Historically, the Haida have carved and raised the totem poles for several important reasons. To honor an elder who's died, to record family ancestry and the accomplishments of the clan, to serve as a reminder for ancient stories that are part of an oral tradition, and to recognize a person who's sponsored a potlatch ceremony. As an aside, the potlatch is a celebration that includes feasting and the exchange of gifts. There might also be singing, storytelling, and dancing, and I'll go into that more a bit later in the semester. But back to the significance of the totem poles. When you see a totem pole, it's obvious that the carvings depict figures of animals and humans stacked one on top of the other. It's probably less clear that the selection and placement of the carved figures is deeply symbolic. So to really understand how important the totem poles are in Haida culture and to have an insight into the symbolism, I want you to think about all of the symbols in a European coat of arms. For example, the coat of arms of Canada includes a unicorn and a lion, a fleur-de-lis and maple leaves. What's the point? Anyone? Come on, I'll give you one guess. Do you mean that this coat of arms is a symbol? I mean, it identifies the people of Canada. Precisely, and that's what a totem pole does as well. It identifies the people of a family or clan or village in a symbolic way. The raven and the eagle are usually incorporated in the pole because the Haida people traditionally belong to one or the other of these two important clans. Other animals may recall a time before people lived on the earth, when birds and animals talked with each other, and supernatural events explained history and provided examples for religious teachings. But some symbols and the stories associated with them, these are known only to the owner of the pole, and of course to the carver. Although some symbolic meanings are repeated, such as the association of healing power with the wolf, or dignity with the bear, still, it's just not possible to recreate a story merely by looking at the pole. So unless the stories are passed down to relatives or recorded by an anthropologist, then the meaning attached to an individual totem pole can be lost. Excuse me. I keep thinking about that old expression, low man on the totem pole. How does that fit in to the symbolism, I mean? (laughs) I knew someone would bring that up. Okay. Low man on the totem pole means a person with very little status, but actually we know that this expression isn't at all in keeping with the tradition of carving totem poles. In fact, the lower figures on the totem pole are usually the most important. Why? For a very practical reason, not symbolic at all. Remember, the size of a totem pole? Well, it's often carved by more than one artist, usually a master carver and a number of apprentices. And the master carver is the one who carves the bottom 10 feet of the pole, leaving the upper figures to the less experienced apprentices. The most elaborate carving and therefore the most important figures are at the bottom of the pole, where people are able to see them more clearly than they can see the figures at the top. In fact, many totem poles have a thunderbird at the top, which serves as a cap. As the lord of the sky, this choice is logical, but... Most of the time, it has very little significance in the story of the pole, and it might be the the crudest carving. So did the Haida people worship the totem poles? That's another old myth. Totem poles were not worshipped and were not used to frighten away evil spirits, as some early records supposed. Now, no one knows exactly how long the Haida have been carving totem poles. And the reason for this is that a cedar pole that's been exposed to the elements... uh, It'll decay in fewer than 100 years. So archaeologists don't have a physical record of totem poles over the centuries. Probably the best description that we have of the tradition dates back to the late 1700s, when European sailing vessels began trading with the Haida. And we know from ship's journals that totem poles were a well-established tradition at that time. Some of them were painted and others weren't. So that option seems to have been left to the discretion of the owner and the carver. 
Okay, it's almost time for the bell to ring, but I want to mention that although our discussions focused on the Haida, interestingly enough, many other Aboriginal people have a history of carving totem poles as well. Just off the top of my head, I'd have to include the Tlingit and Simshin people of Alaska and the Salish people of Western Washington and British Columbia and the Maori people of New Zealand and the, the Ainu people from northern Japan. But that isn't an inclusive list by any means. 29. Which of the following is an important reason the Haida people carve totem poles? Thirty. Listen again to part of the discussion, and then answer the following question. As an aside, the potlatch is a celebration that includes feasting and the exchange of gifts. There might also be singing, storytelling, and dancing, and I'll go into that more a bit later in the semester. What does the professor mean when he says this? As an aside, the potlatch is a celebration that includes feasting and the exchange of gifts. 31. Why does the professor mention the coat of arms of Canada? 32. What does the saying, low man on the totem pole, mean? 33. Why do the master carvers work on the bottom figures? 34. Listen again to part of the discussion, and then answer the following question. Just off the top of my head, I'd have to include the Tlingit, and Simshin people of Alaska, and the Salish people of Western Washington and British Columbia, and the Maori people of New Zealand, and the, the Ainu people from northern Japan. But that isn't an inclusive list by any means. What does the professor mean when he says this? Just off the top of my head, I'd have to include the Tlingit, and Simshin people of Alaska, and the Salish people of Western Washington and British Columbia. 7. Professor's Office Listen to a conversation in a professor's office. Thanks for seeing me. No problem. What... I'm here... Oh, excuse me. Go ahead. I'm here because, well, I just don't seem to be able to keep up with the assignments, I mean. I see. Is that just in my class, or is this a general problem? Oh, no. I'm getting behind in my assignments in all my classes. There's just so much. It's overwhelming. Hmm. But I came to you because I thought you, you could give me some advice. Well, I'll try. So how many classes are you taking? Four, which is about average, I think. And what are they? Sorry? Which classes are you taking? Oh, well, I have Western Civilization, World Literature, um, your class in Psychology, of course, and Philosophy. Uh Uh-huh. Well, that's the problem. All of your courses are reading-intensive classes. If you mean that I have a lot of reading to do, that's the truth. Look, when you registered, did you talk with your advisor? Not really. But you had to have your advisor's signature in order to complete the registration process. Yeah, but I just had him sign it. I I didn't really make an appointment or anything. See, I thought the best thing to do was to get all of my required courses out of the way so I could spend the last two years concentrating on my major. And that's a good plan. But the problem is that you selected four courses that have heavy reading assignments and probably papers to write in addition to tests, right? Right. But most courses have a lot of reading, don't they? Some have more than others. And that's what I mean by a reading-intensive class. Listen, if you'd taken a lab course, like, like botany or chemistry, 
Well, then you would have had one course with a textbook and another course with a small lab manual. Now you'd have had to spend time in the lab to finish your experiments. But you would have received credit for two courses, and you wouldn't have had any papers to write, just tests. Oh, I see. And with the literature, I have eight books to read, plus the textbook, and there are how many? Four or five books in your class. So when you register, you really need to think about the course requirements, so you aren't putting all of your reading-intensive courses together in the same semester. Like I did this time. <laughs> so maybe it's not that I'm such a slow reader. Maybe I just have too much to read. Could be. In any case, the schedule has to be at least part of the problem. So what should I do now? Okay. Well, how are you doing in your classes? I'm getting B's and C's, but I know I could get A's if I had more time in the day, and I'm really worried about those C's. Well, here's a possibility. Why don't you drop one of your courses, the one that takes the most time? That would be my literature class. Well, you could take it next semester. It's offered every term, and you'd have some of the reading done already. But wouldn't that mess up my graduation date? I don't know. You'd have to check that with your advisor to be sure. But maybe the professor would be upset about my dropping the class. Then next semester, when I show up again, you could talk with the professor and explain your plan. But if you decide to do this, you'll need to do it right away because there's a cutoff date for dropping a course, and I think it's the end of this month. I wish I hadn't gotten myself into this. Well, the main thing is to learn from it. So next semester, I could take some reading intensive courses and some that are less reading intensive. And you really should see your academic advisor when you're selecting courses next time. To talk, I mean, not just for a signature. Thirty-five. Why does the man go to see his professor? Thirty-six. Listen again to part of the conversation and then answer the following question. So, how many classes are you taking? Four, which is about average, I think. And what are they? Sorry. Why does the man say this? Sorry. Thirty-seven. What is the man's problem? Thirty-eight. What does the professor suggest? Thirty-nine. What can we infer about the situation? Listening eight. Psychology class. Listen to part of a lecture in a psychology class. The National Institute of Mental Health has been doing some interesting research on chemicals in the brain, the neurotransmitters, by looking at brain images. And at least some of the research has shown that the brain circuits responsible for sleep, appetite, concentration, and and mood. They are altered during depressed states. So, basically, we've concluded that depression is caused by chemical imbalances in the brain, but we're still unclear about what triggers those imbalances in the first place. Some types of depression appear to be genetically inherited, but often there's no family history of depression, or conversely, a person with a family history may never develop a depressive disorder. So it's a thorny problem. Here at the university, we've been studying a disorder called seasonal affective disorder. Norman Rosenthal first identified this disorder in the mid '80s. The theory is that a decrease in light during the long winter months may be responsible for triggering a chemical imbalance that, in turn, may cause depression among those people with a predisposition to depression. Supposedly, there is an area of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is very close to the retina of the eye. 
So this area of the brain responds to light by sending a signal to the pineal gland, and the signal causes the gland to suppress the secretion of a hormone called melatonin. To make a long story short, the more light, the less melatonin in the blood. Okay, the acronym for seasonal affective disorder that's being used in the field is SAD. We didn't come up with that, and in fact, I personally think that it's an inappropriate way to refer to such a serious type of depression, since it sounds rather mild. And seasonal affective disorder can be a very severe and debilitating disorder for some people. In fact, in extreme cases, it's life-threatening when patients become suicidal. So. Anyway, as you can appreciate, the winter here is very dark, cold, and gray. By spring, almost everyone is tired of the gloom. But for some people, those suffering with seasonal affective disorder, it can be a serious problem. People with seasonal affective disorder experience deep and prolonged depression throughout the winter months, with what looks like a spontaneous alleviation of the condition when spring arrives. Before the disorder was identified, it was rather a mystery for friends and family, since the depression appeared to vanish, only to return several months later. Now, although previous research isn't conclusive, we do know that younger people, especially younger women, these women are at a higher risk for developing the disorder and for being affected by it in a more severe form. If I recall, about seventy-five percent of those affected are women, with a typical age of onset about thirty years old. Other factors that contribute to the problem, apart from the long dark days, of course, these factors include heredity and stress. What are the symptoms? Well, the usual spectrum of problems associated with depression. Anxiety, lack of concentration, a tendency to sleep more and eat more, cravings for food with a high sugar content. This may be accompanied by weight gain. On the other hand, some people actually lose their appetites and tend to lose a significant amount of weight. We also see lower energy levels, and for some people, a dull headache may accompany the problem. So, building on the research studies that identified the symptoms of seasonal affective disorder and the high risk profile, we decided to undertake a longitudinal study of 120 subjects, and our research is really focusing on therapies that might help those people affected by SAD. Traditionally, psychotherapy has been used to identify and modify behaviors that contribute to depression. And it's been somewhat successful with patients identified with seasonal affective disorder, especially when used in combination with relaxation and stress reduction therapies. Antidepressant drug therapy has also been proven to reduce depression in studies of people who had seasonal disorders, but we've been using phototherapy almost exclusively with the subjects in our studies. It's very simple, really. We've supplied each subject with a light box that provides the same type of natural lighting that would normally be shining through the window during the spring and summer. The subjects have been instructed to turn on the light box for two hours, and then simply go about their activities in the room where the box is placed. They're not supposed to use the box like a sun lamp. No staring into the light, either with the eyes closed or open. They just ignore it once it's turned on. So, although we're still evaluating our data from the first group of subjects, we have a few preliminary findings that I'll share with you today. First, we think that it's probably better to be exposed to the light box during the morning hours. Second, we're noticing a relationship between sleep patterns and seasonal depression. So maintaining a regular schedule for sleep seems to be a helpful therapy in conjunction with the light treatment. We're also fairly sure that the duration of light therapy can be modified for individuals. Some subjects who were exposed to the light for less than two hours did very well, while others showed no evidence of relief until they re-established the two-hour treatments. One interesting possibility that we're working on. Is whether fluorescent lights might work as well as full spectrum light with the ultraviolet rays filtered out. 
In our first trials, we used UV light exclusively, but now we have some trials underway with fluorescent light, and the results so far are encouraging. I'm also happy to report that there are few subjects who are experiencing side effects. There's no evidence of eye damage. We've been careful to filter out any potentially damaging UV rays. And in fact, the only negative side effect was minor headache that seemed to disappear after a few treatments. So, next semester, we plan to begin the second stage of our studies, and we'll be comparing the degree of depression on the part of subjects undergoing light treatments with control groups who will receive either drug treatments or psychotherapy. What we really want to know is whether light treatments alone are as effective as the other options for therapy. 40. What is this lecture mainly about? Forty one. What are neurotransmitters? Forty two. What happens when there is a reduction of light during the winter months? Forty three. Why does the professor think that the acronym SAD is unsuitable? 44. Listen again to part of the lecture and then answer the following question. Although previous research isn't conclusive, we do know that younger people, especially younger women, these women are at a higher risk for developing the disorder and for being affected by it in a more severe form. If I recall, about 75% of those affected are women with a typical age of onset about 30 years old. What does the professor mean when she says this? If I recall, about 75% of those affected are women with a typical age of onset about 30 years old. 45. In the lecture, the professor reports the preliminary results of her research. Indicate whether each of the following is one of the findings. Click in the correct box for each sentence. 9. Physics class. Listen to part of a discussion in a physics class. Okay, you'll remember that when Einstein was doing his research, uh, the strong and weak forces, they hadn't been identified yet. But still, he had some questions about the two forces that were generally accepted at the time, electromagnetism and gravity. You see, Einstein thought that nature, or rather a theory of nature, a good theory of nature, had to be much simpler, and to use his term, more elegant. So he spent the next 30 years in an effort to arrive at a, a unified field theory that he assumed that, that would demonstrate how these two forces were really defined by one underlying principle. So today, and that would be about 60 years later, a group of physicists believe that they are close to finding that principle in something called the theory of everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. A lot of other equally distinguished physicists are also laughing at this idea. But anyway, for the first time in the history of our field, we have uh, at least uh, a structure, a framework, with the potential to explain every fundamental characteristic of the universe. You see... Until fairly recently, we've been conceptualizing the particles, that is, the protons, neutrons, uh, electrons, quarks, and everything else. We've been viewing them as points, very tiny points, 
But string theory assumes that if we could really take a look at the particles, and that would have to be with technology that we haven't yet discovered, but if we could, then we'd see that the particles aren't points at all, but but strings, and these strings are looped back into themselves. Look, think of the strings like a very thin rubber band. Oh, and and these strings vibrate. So everything in the universe is made up of the same thing then? It's all a combination of of strings? According to the theory, yes. But of course, we see differences. And those differences, uh, they're accounted for because the vibrations of the strings are different. So in physics, you buy into the theory of everything or or what? Well, Jim, the choice isn't that clear. Um, not at all. There are a lot of scientists in between, and by that I mean that they see the theory of everything in a more limited way. They think that string theory, and understand that string theory is incorporated into the theory of everything, um, that string theory can explain all of the properties of the forces that cause the particles to interact and influence each other. Yes, Ellen, did you have a comment? Well, a question really. Wouldn't it be true that if you understand everything about the, I, I think you called it the fundamental characteristics of the universe? So if you understand that, don't you understand everything? Wait a minute. So that'd mean that we know it all now and there isn't anything else to discover, right? Because uh, everything is physics. Everything's just a reaction between vibrating strings. I see your point, but you could, you might look at it as a as a starting place to build our knowledge. Dr. Blake, you said that it'd be a structure, didn't you? So we'd have to fill in a lot of information, but we'd have a structure to start with. In my math class, we were talking about string theory because some of the recent advances in mathematics have been possible because of string theory. True enough. And string theory isn't finished by any means. It's evolved from the beginning when we first started to think about it, and the early models that included both open strings and the closed strings that I just described to you, the ones that look like a thin rubber band. And there's a lot of discussion about vibration, or rather various types of vibration. Then there's the possibility of brains, B-R-A-N-E-S, which are kind of like closed strings with a membrane over them. But all of this is theoretical, right? Because we don't have the technology to observe strings, closed or open, and we certainly can't verify that there are brains out there. Sure, but there are some very complex and, and persuasive mathematical formulas, and they're presented in support of the theories. It isn't like someone's just dreaming this up without calculations. But I don't see why we should accept calculations when some of those calculations require us to think beyond what we can observe. And many physicists would agree with you, Jim. String theory's unverified. Richard Feynman wrote a very interesting book, The Character of Physical Law. And to Feynman, to him, the test of any scientific theory has to be whether the consequences agree with the measurements we take in experiments. Of course, that assumes that the experiment was performed correctly and that the calculations were done without error. But anyway, I think you see the point. So you're saying that string theory requires further developments. What do you think? Well, I tend to be an empirical scientist. I'm a biology major, and I just want to take something into the lab and dissect it. Fair enough. But I'm a physics major, and the idea of a theory of everything appeals to me. I know that we can't observe strings yet, but maybe that's just a problem with the technology. And... And eventually, we may be able to observe strings in the laboratory, or or we could find a way to observe strings in a natural setting, and... Come on. It's just conjecture. Well, in fairness, any new theory has to begin as conjecture. But the real question is, can string theory pass through the developmental stages to a point where it can be verified or rejected? And uh, these developments could be in the area of technology, like Ellen suggests, or perhaps they could be new methods of performing calculations and deriving the mathematical predictions. What I'm going to suggest is that we take a look at the website that supplements your textbook. There are videos as well as animations, and it includes a really good history of string theory. But that's not why I want you to see it. 
I think the site demonstrates where we need to go from here if we're going to pursue an ultimate theory, uh, a theory of everything, if you will. And it's fairly objective, so it should provide us with some interesting data for both sides of the debate. 46. What is the discussion mainly about? Forty seven. How does the professor explain the closed string? Forty eight. Listen again to part of the discussion and then answer the following question. So you're saying that string theory requires further developments? What do you think? Why does the professor say this? What do you think? 49. According to the discussion, what reason does the man give for rejecting string theory? 50. What can be inferred about the students? 51. Why does the professor suggest that the students visit a website? 52. Model test speaking section. The speaking section tests your ability to communicate in English in an academic setting. During the test, you will be presented with six speaking questions. The questions ask for a response to a single question, a conversation, a talk, or a lecture. The prompts and questions are presented only one time. You may take notes as you listen, but notes are not graded. You may use your notes to answer the questions. Some of the questions ask for a response to a reading passage and a talk or a lecture. The reading passages and the questions are written, but the directions will be spoken. Your speaking will be evaluated on both the fluency of the language and the accuracy of the content. You will have 15 to 20 seconds to prepare and 45 to 60 seconds to respond to each question. Typically, a good response will require all of the response time and the answer will be complete by the end of the response time. You will have about 20 minutes to complete the speaking section. A clock on the screen will show you how much time you have to prepare each of your answers and how much time you have to record each response. Number 1. Listen for a question about a familiar topic. After you hear the question, you have 15 seconds to prepare and 45 seconds to record your answer. Think about a book that you have enjoyed reading. Why did you like it? What was especially interesting about the book? Use specific details and examples to support your response. Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Number 2. Listen for a question that asks your opinion about a familiar topic. 
After you hear the question, you have 15 seconds to prepare and 45 seconds to record your answer. Agree or disagree with the following statement. Traveling independently is better than traveling as part of a tour group. Use specific reasons and examples to support your opinion. Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Number three, read a short passage and listen to a talk on the same topic. Then listen for a question about them. After you hear the question, you have 30 seconds to prepare and 60 seconds to record your answer. A public meeting is planned to discuss alternatives for renovating the original building on campus. Read the notice from the college newspaper. You have 45 seconds to complete it. Please begin reading now. Now listen to a professor who is speaking at the meeting. She is expressing her opinion about the proposals. Although there may be some practical reasons for tearing down the structure surrounding the clock tower, I urge the committee to consider the historical importance of Old Main and opt for renovation of the original structure. I think we all agree that the brick structure is quite beautiful and basically sound, only a few minor repairs would be necessary to preserve it. The cost of new electrical and plumbing systems for the old structure would be less than the cost of a new building with the same systems. And if a new building were to be erected, the clock tower would seem out of place somehow. The professor expresses her opinion of the plan for the renovation of Old Main. Report her opinion and explain the reasons that she gives for having that opinion. Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep.
Number four. Read a short passage and then listen to part of a lecture on the same topic. Then listen for a question about them. After you hear the question, you have 30 seconds to prepare and 60 seconds to record your answer. Now read the passage about Pangaea. You have 45 seconds to complete it. Please begin reading now. Now listen to part of a lecture in a geography class. The professor is talking about Pangaea. The theory of continental drift posits that 250 million years ago, the continents were all connected in one gigantic continent, which we refer to as Pangaea, and that was surrounded by one huge ocean called Panthalassa. At that time, the northernmost region of the continent corresponded to a landmass that included most of the modern continent of Asia. And Europe was south of the Asian region instead of north, as it is now. So, Asia and Europe were connected to the west with what is now North America. Africa and the Arabian Peninsula were positioned south of Europe with South America to the west, India to the east, and Antarctica and Australia south and southeast. Then, about 200 million years ago, this supercontinent began to separate into a northern continent and a southern continent. The northern continent was made of what is currently North America, Greenland, Europe, and Asia, and the southern continent included Antarctica, Australia, India, and South America. By 135 million years ago, the two continents had moved into positions that began to resemble the map that we see today, with seven continents. Explain how plate tectonics relates to the theory of continental drift. Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Number five. Listen to a short conversation. Then listen for a question about it. After you hear the question, you have 20 seconds to prepare and 60 seconds to record your answer. Now listen to a short conversation between a student and her friend. Are you still having headaches? Yeah, I'm taking Tylenol every day. Mm, that doesn't sound good. Why don't you go over to the health center? I keep thinking it'll go away. Probably just a tension headache. I feel really stressed out this semester. Well, you're probably right. But it still wouldn't hurt to get a checkup. 
Maybe the doctor will refer you for an eye exam. I used to get headaches from eye strain, especially when I was using my computer a lot. And guess what? I needed to get my glasses changed. No kidding? I hadn't thought about that, but I do notice that it gets worse after I've been using my computer. Well, then, that's important to mention when you see the doctor at the health center. You think I should still go to the health center? I mean, if it's my eyes, I... I could just make an appointment with the eye doctor. You could, but you really aren't sure what it is. I'd go to the doctor at the health center, and I'd ask for a referral to the eye doctor. Besides, if you get referred, I think your student health insurance will pay most of the cost of new glasses. Describe the woman's problem and the two suggestions that her friend makes about how to handle it. What do you think the woman should do, and why? Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Number six, listen to part of a lecture, then listen for a question about it. After you hear the question, you have 20 seconds to prepare and 60 seconds to record your answer. Now listen to part of a lecture in a business class. The professor is discussing the way that a fax machine transmits and receives data. Okay, to illustrate my point that many new machines are simply combinations of machines that are already available, Let's talk about the fax machine. To understand how a fax machine works, I'd like you to think of it as three machines, a copier, a modem, and a printer. First, the data is copied. How does that happen? Well, when you load paper into the fax machine, a light shines on it, and optical sensors read whether a specific point on the paper is black or white. These sensors communicate the digital information into a microprocessor, where a copy of the page is made of black or white dots. Thus, you see that in the first step, the fax machine functions like a copier. Next, the fax machine works like a modem. Remember, a modem takes a black and white image and converts this digital data into an analog signal, that is, electronic impulses that can be sent over a phone line. The fax machine calls another fax machine to transmit using two different types of tones to represent the black and white dots in the document. For example, it might send an 800 hertz tone for white and a 1300 hertz tone for black. The last part of a fax machine is the printer. After the receiving fax machine answers the sending fax machine, it begins to accept the electronic impulses and then it converts them back to the black and white dots in a digital image. Finally, it prints the image out on paper, just like any other printer. Using the main points and examples from the lecture, describe the three parts of a fax machine, and then explain how the fax process works. Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep.
Model Test Seven. Writing Section. First, read the passage and take notes. Now listen to a lecture on the same topic as the passage that you have just read. No one would deny that the urban forest is a positive aspect of our city, or that we need a plan to take care of the mature trees. However, many earlier attempts to protect the existing urban forest by legislation have not succeeded, and in my opinion, this plan is also destined to fail. The first goal, legislation, sounds good on the surface, but legislating the problem hasn't worked very well over the years. The reasons that past laws have come to nothing are first because the legislation was too complicated, too many rules published in language that wasn't easily understood, and second, the legislation was simply not enforced. The consequences of ignoring the law didn't deter anyone from breaking the law. Next. Support to maintain and conserve the trees is just another way to say that taxes are going to increase. It would be wonderful if the public would voluntarily come forward to provide funding for the project, but again, in the past, a very small percentage of the budget for maintenance and conservation has come from private donations. Almost 80 percent has come from taxes, and although this new plan doesn't specify how much of a tax increase will be necessary, it's clearly going to cost taxpayers to implement it. The public information campaign is probably the best idea, and it should happen before anything else. But again, in the past, similar campaigns have focused on very vague goals like improving the lifestyle, and I hear the same ambiguous incentives again this time. If the public is going to support a costly project, people need to see how their lives will be improved. Will golfers enjoy a better golf course? Will the dog park be cleaned up for pet owners? These are the specifics that the public might be willing to support. Summarize the main points in the lecture, and then explain how they cast doubt on the ideas in the reading passage. Model test set. Example answers. Example answer for independent speaking question one: A book. The Power of Positive Thinking by Dr. Norman Vincent Peale is one of my favorite books.、Um, according to Dr. Peale. A positive outlook is essential to a happy, successful life. But what's especially interesting about the book are the practical strategies that help maintain an optimistic approach to living, even when、uh, things don't happen to be going well. He recommends reflection on all the aspects of life that are positive, and cultivating an attitude of gratitude. He also recommends positive statements and mental pictures to encourage and motivate and. And to replace negative thoughts that come to mind. Example answer for independent speaking question two: Foreign travel. I agree that traveling independently is better than traveling as part of a tour group. I've taken several tours, but I prefer to make my own travel plans because I don't want to spend a lot of time at tourist hotels. In my experience, large hotels insulate travelers from the foreign culture. Instead of eating typical food, they prepare special meals for the tourists. And when I'm with groups of tourists, it's less likely that local people will approach me to talk. On my own, I've had some wonderful conversations with locals. Another reason that I like to travel independently is because I'm kind of a spontaneous person, so I like to take advantage of opportunities that present themselves on the trip. Example answer for integrated speaking question three: Old Main. The professor doesn't support the plan to demolish the main structure of Old Main and build a new structure around the original clock tower. She presents three arguments.、Um, First, she says that the brick structure now standing is strong, and it would require only minor repairs. And second, she points out that the electrical and plumbing problems in the old building could be repaired for less than the the expenditure for a new building. Finally, she opposes the construction of a new building around the original clock tower because she thinks that the tower would be would look odd in the new setting. She would probably support the alternative plan, which is um. To repair the original building. Example answer for integrated speaking question four, Pangaea. According to the theory of plate tectonics, 
the outer layer of the Earth is made up of plates that are continually moving and consequently changing the relative position of the land and oceans. Building on this theory, scientists have proposed that about 250 million years ago, there was only one landmass, a huge continent that they've named Pangaea, and it included all of the continents that we observe today. But about 200 million years ago, the plates caused Pangaea to drift and break into a northern continent that included North America, Greenland, Asia, and Europe, and a southern continent that contained South America, India, Antarctica, and Australia. By about 135 million years ago, the plates had separated the land masses into more or less the seven continents that we recognize today and position them fairly close to their current locations. Example answer for integrated speaking question 5. Headaches. The woman's suffering from daily headaches, and she's controlling the pain by taking Tylenol. The man suggests that she make an appointment with a doctor at the health center because the problem should be diagnosed by a professional. But he also mentions the possibility that the doctor might refer her for an eye exam. Apparently, the problem's worse when she's been staring at the computer for long periods of time. Um, he reminds her that if the doctor at the health center refers her for the eye exam, the student health insurance may pay a large percentage of the cost for glasses. So I think the woman should take the man's advice because eye strain is a common problem for college students, and she probably does need an eye appointment. But by going to the doctor at the health center first, she can be certain that there isn't something more serious going on. And if she needs glasses, the referral will probably allow her to use her insurance benefit. Example answer for integrated speaking question 6. Fax machines. A fax machine has three parts. The fax that's sending text and images has sensors to read black and white points on paper and communicate the patterns digitally to a microprocessor. And the microprocessor, it recreates the images in black and white dots. So this part of the process is like a copy machine. So then the digital information, I mean the image in black and white dots, it's converted into an analog signal that's made up of electronic impulses. The impulses are sent over a phone line like a modem. Then the fax machine that's sending the information connects with another fax machine that's receiving the information. They communicate with two tones, one that signals a black dot and another that signals a white dot. And the fax machine that receives the tones begins to print the dots on paper in the same way that any printer produces an image. So a fax is really a combination, copier, modem, and printer.